Okay, we're going to end up our investigation of phylum chordata with um, a discussion about amniotes. So, as I've already talked about, a key, key, key invention of vertebrate evolution is the invention of the amniotic egg. So, what you should know by now is that amniotes are um, include reptiles and birds and mammals and since um, as you know, as I've alluded to before, that yeah, I'm having trouble with getting my pointer here. Can't do it ahead of time. Because birds are really reptiles, you could just say the amniotes include reptiles and mammals. So let's talk about this really critical invention, the amniotic egg, also known as the shelled egg. So in the shelled egg, you have a fluid-filled sac in which the embryo develops. Um, and as I've just indicated, that amniotes include reptiles and mammals. Now, this is a huge ev um, ev evolutionary development because it is it helps avoid desiccation. So if you look at your frog egg, it has to st um, be laid in the embryo develops in a pond or a lake or some aquatic environment. But here, what we have, we have the embryo has its little pond right in here with it in the egg. So the shelled egg it really allows, allows the reptiles to become truly terrestrial and totally divorced from their dependency on water. So let's look at what are called the four extra embryonic membranes. And again, the original amniotes developed these four embryonic membranes. And these were the same embryonic membranes you had around you when you were an embryo and a fetus developing inside your mother. Because remember, we are mammals and mammals are amniotes. So it's amniotes are actually named after this membrane right here, the amnion. The amnion, the amniotic membrane uh, forms a little sac around the growing embryo, which contains the amniotic fluid. Again, here's the embryo in its own little puddle, own little pond water right here. So the embryos no longer have to develop in a body of water. So just like you had an amniotic sac around you when you were a fetus, um, who knows what kind of embryo this is. This could be an embryonic reptile, could be an embryonic chicken. All right, another extra embryonic membrane is the atlantois. In humans, this helps form your umbilical cord. Another extra embryonic membrane is the chorion, which is always involved with gas exchange. You see it around um, the inner part of the shell here. In humans, the chorion helps form the placenta. And then there's the yolk sac, which is more vestigial in humans, but especially in birds and reptiles, the yolk sac contains a food source. So all amniotes, which include reptiles, birds, and mammals, the embryo develops and surrounding the body of the embryo are these four extra embryonic membranes. Again, that's why they're called extra embryonic membranes. The amnion, the chorion, the allantois, and the yolk sac. So what's the benefit of the shelled egg? The shelled egg keeps the embryo hydrated. The shell um, avoids desiccation, avoids drying out. However, it's still, the egg is porous, the eggshell is porous, so it still allows gas exchange. So again, this was the huge invention that allowed reptiles to be the first group of animals, vertebrate animals, to be totally divorced from having to live around bodies of water. Now, one problem that had to be overcome is sexual reproduction without water. And to do this, we have internal fertilization. So in order to put a shell around the embryo, intern, um, fertilization has to be internal. And that means the sperm meets the egg inside the female's body. So instead of the sperm swimming through a body of water, it's swimming through the fluids in the female's body. Once you have the zygote, the fertilized egg, it starts to develop um, into an embryo. And then in the female's fallopian tubes, the shell is secreted around the developing embryo, and then the egg is laid in amniotes that actually lay eggs. So now we get into a little weird part about the books. In the diagram that I showed you, the traditional view is that there were two main lineages that descended from reptiles, the diapsids and the synapsids. And the one branch of reptiles evolved into modern reptiles, and the other branch of reptiles, the synapsids, SIDS evolved into mammals. 
However, if you would put, so basically traditional view is to move this reptile box down here. However, your book wants to talk about reptiles as a clade. And so a clade would be the ancestor and all the descendants. And your book does not want to call mammals reptiles. In fact, nobody wants to call mammals reptiles. So if reptiles is a clade, um, and we put reptiles here, then that would include mammals. So that doesn't work. So what your book, your book does, and I'll emphasize your book, it says, all right, well, synapses didn't really evolve from reptiles. They evolved from some ancestral amniote. Now, they don't really describe this ancestral and amniote in great detail, but we, we would all agree it's really reptilian-like. Now, this is how your book chooses to treat it. I've looked at other biology books, and they say, well, reptiles is not a clade. So they go back and they put reptiles down here. And they say reptiles is a very useful term. Um, however, it's not a clade because they say it just refers to the ancestral reptiles and the diapsids, et cetera, et cetera, diapsids, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I don't really care whether you say mammals evolved from reptiles you put reptiles down here, or reptile mammals evolved from synapses that evolved from an ancestral amniote that seemed very reptilian in nature. That's up to you. We'll let the taxonomists duke it out. But this is the approach that your book takes. And as we've said before, if you include snakes and extinct alligator, or sorry, dinosaurs and alligators and turtles, all is reptiles then we're going to have to include birds in the clade of reptiles too. So let's go over some key, uh, key features of reptiles. Reptiles, again, they are the ones, they are the group of animals, vertebrate animals today that are exclusively terrestrial. terrestrial. They learned how to <coughs> reproduce, live, breathe out, without being tied to a body of water. So let's go over what we I've sort of alluded to before. How do reptiles prevent desiccation, dehydration, drying out in the sun? Well, first of all, reptiles are covered with scales that are made out of keratin, and these scales are watertight. So a reptile, a turtle, a crocodile, they can lay out in the sun all day, and they will not dehydrate. How do they reproduce sexually without a body of water? Well, as I went over, they have internal fertilization, so they don't need to mate in a pond or a stream. The sperm swim through the fluid of the female's body to fertilize the egg. And then the embryo is wrapped up in a shell. So again, these illustrate the amniotic egg, also called the shelled egg, as opposed to, for instance, the amphibian egg, which will not prevent desiccation. And how do reptiles obtain oxygen? If you're thinking they obtain oxygen by lungs, you would be absolutely correct. So reptiles, no gills, no longer in the picture. They have very well developed lungs in order to obtain their oxygen. All right, so existing or extant reptiles include, can you think of them? Lizards and snakes, turtles, crocodiles and alligators. To collectively, these are called crocodilians. Um, <laughs> tuatars. Um, the tuatarans, they look a lot like lizards, but they're um, different enough that uh, scientists put two ataras in a different group. And there's the extinct reptiles, which include dinosaurs. Now, I've made this pretty obvious. What did I leave out of existing dinosaurs? It, or, sorry, existing reptiles. If you said birds, you were correct. Again, if we count, if we take reptiles as a clade, or even if you move reptiles over here, if you look at diapsids and their descendants as a clade, if you recall snakes and extinct dinosaurs and crocodiles, if we call these all reptiles, then we have to call birds reptiles. So reptiles today include, well, lizards, snakes, turtles, crocodilians, birds, and the extinct dinosaurs. So these are all classified as reptiles. So birds, most biologists considered birds to be highly derived or highly specialized reptiles. And in fact, most scientists, but I was talking to someone in the hallway today, not all, but most scientists consider birds to be existing dinosaurs. Um, this is the one lineage that did not go extinct 65 million years ago. 
Do you remember Archaeopteryx? This was a transition fossil found at almost the exact same year that Charles Darwin first published his book on the origin of the species. So this is the fossil that's found, and this is the artist's rendition. Truly transitional. Archaeopteryx was truly transitional between a uh, reptilian dinosaur and a bird. So you'll notice that Archaeopteryx has a beak with teeth. There are no modern birds that have be beaks with teeth. You can see the reptilian claws still present on the wings. They have a bony tail, not like your pet parakeet where it just feathers, just fluffs down here. Um, so again, this was truly transitional. All right, so back to characteristics of birds. They're highly derived reptiles. And you can see evidence of their reptilian heritage. Their feathers are made out of keratin, and you can see under a microscope that they're really just modified scales. There's still scales, just like the reptiles have, on their legs. They have the shelled egg, the amniotic egg, just like reptiles. And the key thing about birds is they are adapted for flight. Even flightless birds are adapted for flight. So an obvious adaptation of birds for flight is feathers. Another um, adaptation is hollow bones. So the hollow bones with this um, sort of honeycomb lattice work in here, um, they're very lightweight. They're adapted for flight. So be sure to read this carefully in your study guides and be able to list or discuss on a test, for instance, several adaptations birds have for flight. All right, and just a reminder that most scientists today consider birds extant dinosaurs. All right, now this is sort of an interesting characteristic. All other extant reptiles are ectotherms, and we already discussed what ectotherms mean. But birds are endotherms, or warm brothers, warm blooded. They maintain their own body temperature. And so what the evidence points to is that there were some endothermic dinosaurs, and we believe that today's bird lineages um, have descended from these endothermic dinosaurs. Um, this idea of endothermic dinosaurs, it generated a, a lot of excitement, a little bit of controversy when it was first proposed. Um, like most new ideas in science, people like, at first the reaction is, no way, that can't be. And then the evidence comes in and now it's pretty much standard accepted. Oh yeah, some dinosaurs were endotherms. All right, birds have a four-chambered heart. Um, this really allows them to pump blood and get oxygen to all their muscles. Uh, again, birds have very, very high metabolic needs. Um, you've heard people say, oh, that person eats like a bird. Well, a bird usually eats their weight, double their weight in food daily. So eating like a bird does not mean probably what it should mean. All right. So are reptiles mammals? Again, other biology books put reptiles right here. And the answer to this is clearly no. Nobody wants to call mammals reptiles. Again, you can say, you can argue, did they descend from reptiles? We know they descended from synapsids. So did synapsids evolve directly from reptiles? Or did synapsids evolve from this sort of amorphic, nebulous, ancestral amniote that was reptile-like but wasn't a reptile? So again, the answer to this question is universally no. We do not consider mammals to be reptiles. The question is, do we want to consider reptile this useful term, or like some biology books do, or do we want to consider reptiles a clade, which is the approach that your biology book takes? All right, let's go over the key characteristics of mammals. They are named for their mammary glands. So the universal characteristics of mammals is they all have hair and they all produce milk for their young. And once again, this is the feature from which they derive their name. So milk is the last great evolutionary um, innovation um, that we will discuss. Um, not only is the young, are the young well protected within the female's body developmentally um, during development, that's sort of redundant, once the mammal is born, they receive species-specific species milk, which is just perfect, perfectly adapted uh, for the young animal, whatever it is. All right, as I just said, the two key characteristics of mammals are the production of milk and hair. And once again, a hair follicle is made out of keratin. And if you look under a microscope, it looks like a modified scale. So again, mammals either evolved from reptiles or something that looked an awful lot like a reptile. You choose, I don't really care. <laughs> 
additional characteristics of mammals. They are endothermic. We've already talked about what that means. They have horn chambered hearts, just like birds, because they have a high metabolic need. They have a diaphragm. This enables them to expand their lungs more easily, again, to meet their high metabolic needs. Uh, here's an interesting characteristic about mammals. We have differentiated teeth. Okay, so yeah, you might recognize these terms if you've ever been to the orthodontist or the dentist, incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. Again, characteristics of mammals. So if you look at reptilian skulls, you're not going to get differentiated teeth. All right, and mammals, like birds, have complex brains and behavior. All right, there's three main lineages of mammals. Um, this, this is, so again, let's review where we are. Domain, eukaryote, kingdom, animal, phylum, chordata, subphylum, vertebrate, class, mammal, order, monotremes. So monotremes is an order of what you might call a primitive mammal. They still lay eggs. So if you learned in grade school that all mammals give live birth, that's not true. The monotremes still lay eggs like our reptilian or reptilian-like ancestors, all right? You only find monotremes in the Australian, New Zealand area, and the echidna um, or the spiny anteater is one example of a monotreme, and a duck-billed platypus is another. Marsupials is another order of mammals. That's the pouched mammals. And you've seen the video of a baby kangaroo being born. It's an embryonic form, and it has to crawl up about a foot to the top of its mother's pouch where it can find the nipple and drink its little baby kangaroo milk. But the most successful mammals at all are what your book calls the eutherians, and most of us just like to call placental mammals. And have looked, other biology books still call them placental mammals. Your book doesn't like to use the placental mammals because marsupials have a sort of a tiny, real temporary placenta. Well, of course, all placentas are temporary organs. But to me, it's sort of like, you know, even though sharks have a little bit of bone, we still can call bony fish bony fish. And I'm still okay with calling uh, eutherians placental mammals. The young develop inside the mother's uterus. Um, it's again attached to a placenta, but it develops past the embryonic stage. So it looks like a mini adult when it is born. And there's the amniotic sac falling off that baby zebra. And so there are many, many orders of eutherians, and you can explore these when you do your lecture guide. A couple interesting facts. There are about 4,000 species of mammals. 1,000 of those species are bats. Isn't that crazy? There's 1,000 different species of bats. And 2,000 of those species are different kinds of rodents, rats, mice, squirrels, beavers, etc., etc. So there you are. Explore your links, and I'll see you on the next unit.